Hello and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And I want to welcome this morning, we're going to talk about big climate change and how that is shaking out for the rest of us. So Senator Chris Pearson from Chittenden County, so glad you can be with us this morning. Good morning, great to be here. And of course, regular <laughs> contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro. Always glad to see you too. And just for the um, benefit of our podcast and our radio listeners, Emily's beautiful yellow sunny sweater is a lovely match to the walls in uh, Chris's study right now. So um, it, it's always nice to have a little bit of coordination in the morning, right? <laughs> and so if you're listening via podcast, maybe this is your big incentive to go jump on over to the YouTube channel. Yes, and, and see the, the lovely sunshiny yellow. Um, I guess it's maybe a little earthy, but you, you can write in and tell us what you think the color yellow is, then we'll know who's actually watching. Um, so we're, as I mentioned, talking about climate change this morning. And uh, Chris Pearson is one of the folks who's been involved with the Climate Council and the Global Solutions Act. And uh, we wanted to just dive in, Chris, and hear how are things going? What, at what point is the work at now? And what are you kind of gearing up for with the legislative session starting in January? Um, well, those are big questions. I, I'll, I'll give you just Climate a little- Climate change is a big thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does it make sense to give just a little background on the Global Warming Solutions Act I'd and love kind that. Of how yes. we got here? Thank you. Um, I first went to the legislature, I was in the House starting in 2006, and I would say back then my motivation and previous to that, getting involved in campaigns was really around climate. And I think it was 2007, maybe, that the legislature, and I was delighted to hear this, we voted on some emission reduction targets and we put them into law, but they weren't law, they were sort of aspirations. And so uh, as the legislature does, we patted ourselves on the back, and, oh good, we're addressing climate. And we went on home and, and I was then sort of naive enough and just beginning to think that this was significant. It wasn't significant in the slightest. We just blew, they, they might as well not even have been printed into, into law and we just blew through them. They were largely meaningless. Um, so fast forward to a couple of years ago, we, we, the Global Warming Solutions Act as a package was seen as a foundation. It first of all took the similar targets, emission reduction targets, basically as outlined in the Paris Accord, put them into law, into statute, they are requirements. We also created, we knew kind of, it's, it's funny, the legislature knew not to trust itself. <laughs> And we said, you love we're not, even though we, we have these targets, we're not going to actually have the bandwidth and the, the discipline to enact the laws to meet those targets. So we set up, that's the way I think of it anyway, we set up this council, 23 members from all across the state, broad range of expertise, and we charge them, tell us how Vermont should meet these targets. How can we do this? And, um, and, and we knew that it had to be independent from us. You know, frankly, it's, it's not just that sometimes we lack political fortitude. It's that there's a mental health crisis, there's a housing crisis, there's a pension crisis, there's a lot going on for Montpelier. And so in a way, we, we guaranteed that we would not get uh, too distracted maybe from the climate crisis, which some might argue, I might argue, trumps them all. Um, in terms of our long range sustainability. So, so um, we did those things. And then we also gave citizens the right to hold us accountable by uh, uh, what's called the citizen suits. Yeah. So if the plan is not actually honoring the science, citizens have the right to go to court and, and say, do a better plan. You know, this is not about citizens taking a lawsuit and getting rich by any stretch. That's not the way this works, but it does hold us accountable. If, if the governor and the administration don't carry through on the plan, 
citizens bring them to court and enjoin them to, to follow the plan. So we, we have that accountability, we have the goals, and we have a mechanism to, to come up with the strategies. The good news is the plan now, the first plan, this will be an ongoing process, it's just come out. Um, and, and there's a lot in there that's uh, interesting to me, but if there's a single theme, it's actually that Montpelier has been doing some of the right things, but not nearly enough. So, so we've been doing weatherization. We need to amplify that about 10 times over. We've been doing electric car uh, infrastructure. We need to amplify that. You know, so it, it's sort of saying, yeah, you're on the right track, kind of, but amplify it in a, in a very significant way to meet the time and the scientific uh, requirements of, of how, if you want to meet those targets. And something we've we've actually talked about quite a lot on the show is how in the particular way that the legislative and administrative process finds its way to compromise, we often put a little drop in a bucket towards an idea and then say, and then don't adequately fund it, don't adequately staff it, and then say, oh, wow, that idea didn't work, when in fact, we just mm-hmm. never actually tried hard enough um, or appropriately. We and didn't so resource it well. We enough, didn't resource basically. it well enough, and so we think we disproved our own theory, but in fact, we just never tested our theory. And so that was a really exciting um, part of this for me, and a really exciting theme that came out of. Um, we had a public conversation last night about the Climate Council's recommendations. We had more than two hundred people come from all over the state via Zoom. Um, we had. Sorry, I did not send the link to you about that one, Olga. Um, we had to go there, yes. breakout groups from every county. Of course, Wyndham County was very well represented there, as were, I think, almost every other county. And yeah. um, we, the Wyndham County group was actually diving into exactly that. Like, what does it mean to really do this, um, to fully fund this, to fully like think about the implications of that? And I think the power of the Climate Council sits in just that, that they can take that time, like you said, Chris, to really think through what are the problems with this, what are the opportunities here, um, move beyond sort of the halfway version of compromise that we often find ourselves to. And then there's the federal money, which makes everything possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's exciting in the sense that, I mean, we're really late. It's, it's, it's funny to say exciting in the realm of, of combating the climate crisis, but, but there's a a deeply growing awareness. There's there's actually pools of money like we've never seen, um, and we have this plan. So uh, kind of maybe a confluence of events where Vermonters and and Vermonters are are less and less patient. Really, uh, it's more front of mind as we saw this past summer. You know, smoke in the skies because of wildfires out west and tornadoes just the other day ripping through the heart of the country and you know i mean it, 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 i guess you can deny it if you want to but there's if you're if you're willing to face the reality um the headlines are are pretty stark right the the mm-hmm. ice shelf in antarctic i mean scary stuff um but there's to me there's this opportunity of strengthening our economy kind of getting just out in front we're late but out in front maybe compared to our peers in terms of strengthening our local economy and, and moving it away from fossil fuels. And if we do that three, five, 10 years ahead of others, actually that's gonna be very good for us uh, to say nothing of the climate. What I, um, when I think about teeny little Vermont and it's teeny little carbon footprint um, and the scale of the crisis and, you know, headlines yesterday about like ice caps, break ice shelves. I don't even know my Antarctic language, but anyway, shelves breaking, more catastrophe, completely overwhelming. And it often makes me feel like there's nothing that we can actually do for all of this on the scale that we're operating at. And what I saw in the pieces of the plan that I've had an opportunity to review so far is that there are a lot of opportunities here that are going to make a immediate difference in people's quality of life Mm -hmm. in addition to the fact that it's going to be doing our part towards this global crisis and that's really really powerful for me because I think until we can figure out ways that these changes can be felt 
by people as change, it's going to be really hard to keep up the political momentum, the social momentum on this, given all of the other crises that you sort of um, mentioned at the beginning of the hour, Chris. I would love, uh, Chris and Emily, if you could dive into that concept of strengthening our economy and improving people's quality of life, because the flip side or the, the other side of the, the climate um, conversation has also been, you know, how do we transition people? Um, and quite often, I think it is couched in language of what people will be going without. Yeah. or what they'll have to give up or how it how climate change negatively affects people's lives but also how adapting to climate change will negatively affect people's lives um and i know in vermont we we do have some concern about our more rural communities and transportation issues and and um that those aspects of how do those communities not get left behind so you know that's a lot to unpack and so i would i would love to hear about how we're improving people's lives, how we're making the state more resilient and, and those sorts of other big questions to answer. Should we start with those top line just to center the conversation a little bit? There's sort of like some top line recommendations that came out of the Climate Council. Is that helpful, Olga, or should we just jump right in? Um, the top line would be good, yes. Okay. Chris, you well, have that right? Yeah, sure. Uh, and these are, um, I should say, they're, they're not the top line necessarily out of the climate action plan. They are what a group of us have, have come to believe is uh, important and possible in the upcoming session, right? And, and your listeners know that Montpelier will operate for four and a half months in 2022. It's not a lot of time. And we do have a handful of other work to do. So what, what a lot of us have been dedicated to doing is, as you say, build momentum. Like we've got the climate action plan. We need uh, aggressive steps right away. But we also know this is a multi-year challenge, to say the least. So so what I, what I think would maybe help, and I'll try to do it quickly, is about 10 items that we think are realistic to get into law in the coming session. And they're, they're each ambitious. Um, and we probably won't get all 10, but we're going to fight to get them all. Um, so I'll give it. So, but, but I just want, it's a small caveat. It's not exactly the plan, but they are all informed by the plan. Many of them called for by the plan. Um, so, so right off the top, and this is directly in the plan, an environmental justice lens. There are bills floating around the modeled after what other states have done and proved, hopefully. Uh, I know Emily's been deeply involved in this. And the idea is, as we address the crisis, we can't leave behind uh, BIPOC community. We can't leave behind our rural community. We have to be, pay special attention to families who have low income. Um, you know, it's not all about electric cars and then we, we wash our hands of this challenge, right? And, and, and so the idea would be a framework that the state would permanently use to address uh, where we're making investments and strategies going forward. Um, so it's sometimes called a just transition uh, environmental justice kind of framework. And Emily, you've done a lot of work on this. Uh, um, are there details there you want to add? Um, so there's, yeah, I think that, sure. Um, there's the idea that any solutions are going to ensure that we're bringing everyone along with us and leaving no one behind. And, you know, like you said, Chris, it's, you know, communities of color, it's poor folks, it's um, disabled folks, it's rural folks, as you mentioned earlier, Olga. And then the other piece is that we make sure that everything we're doing is informed by those folks. So we're not just making assumptions about what my constituents and Mountain Home want for the transition. We're actually asking them what they want for the mm -hmm. transition and understanding the on the ground situation that they're in still recovering from Irene and trying to pay their lot rents, right? right? And so it's really about finding a way to both ensure that policies are equitable and just, but also ensure that the process that leads to those policies is equitable and just, which is such a really inspiring and fun stretch for the legislative and administrative process, because it means we're gonna have to go beyond public hearings. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a, a, a clear top line. Um, another one that's um, 
been on my mind for years. We were at this uh, in 2020 and, and, and frankly, making some progress, but then the pandemic shut it down, is the move to our, our uh, make sure that our electric grid is 100% renewable. You know, the, basically the energy strategy around climate, um, it, not behavioral change and stuff, but the energy strategy is move off of fossil fuels, move towards electricity. Well, right now, at least 40% of the power coming into Vermont comes from fossil fuels. So if you if you turn off your gas car and turn to an electric car and then you power that by fossil by natural gas electricity, you've actually lost because there's no, you're more efficient just in your gas car. So we have got to get this right. Uh, there's something called the Renewable Energy Standard. That is the law that dictates what uh, our utilities are doing. And over time, they're increasing their dependence on renewable energy. Um, the current law gets us to about 75% renewable by 32, 2032. We want to get it to 100% renewable by 2030. We can do that. There's a, a much more mature conversation happening now where Green Mount Power, for instance, is negotiating with renewable interests. And um, so as we get to 100% renewable, how we do that matters. So we're going to be pushing an increase in small local um, renewable power about uh, right now it's a requirement of 10%. We want to at least double that. That's important for a number of reasons, jobs, um, uh, chief among them. Um, and then all of the, most of the energy we buy in Vermont is bought from out of state. Mm -hmm. And to the extent you can, you can pull that in, in state, you, you generate a stronger local economy to say nothing of a resilient grid, right? We, we, we've come to understand that we don't need one big Yankee for the whole, for the whole state. We want a lot of little distributive energy. And so, so there's a requirement in there. And then uh, crudely, we wanna make sure that we are not just saying, okay, we need to be renewable. Let's go get more energy from big hydro, particularly hydro Quebec. But let's, our, our own responsibility as a state is to generate new development, wind, solar, uh, even, even small uh -huh. hydro, yeah, around the region, which is what most states are doing, and we need to do our part. So there's a, a way to inspire that or compel that. And finally, all of that hinges on not increasing our reliance on Hydro-Quebec. And so we sort of, at least the proposal is to say, okay, what you get from Hydro-Quebec, that's what you get. You can't get wrecks on top of that, which sort of creates this fiction of renewable energy. We don't need to, to draw down on HQ, but we're not going to let you keep going. And so that's, that's our beginning point. I actually think there's some chance that we'll see a coalition coming together of the utilities and, and renewable interests and say, yeah, this is the right path for us. Very exciting. Be very hard to do if we're fighting the utilities uh, on this, that, you know, because for one thing, they're they're very cognizant of rate pressure, which all of us should be. You know, um, that's not a trivial thing of people paying their electric bill. So, uh, but you got to get it right. You, if, if you don't have this foundation of a, of a renewable grid then a lot of the rest of the strategy is sort of fiction because it's all dependent on switching off the fossil fuels and turning to electrification. And for any very diligent listeners, so at some point in the summer, I think in August, we had John Woodward on to talk about grid edge and modernizing the grid. And so if people want to go into the archives, you might be able to find that conversation there. And that was very focused on this um, diversifying and electrifying the grid and making it more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Um, I better go quickly here because we're running out of time, but transportation is obviously a big one. Most of that is sort of, hey, you've been doing little bits of what we need to do. Accelerate that in a big way. Accelerate the, the electric car infrastructure, the incentives, and accelerate programs like uh, Improve Your Ride. What's it called, Emily? It, uh, right. Where we help. Sorry. Swap. It right Gosh, I, I am sorry, Molly, yeah. if you ever hear this, if anyone <laughs> in Brattleboro is listening to this on the radio, Molly Burke is your gal for yeah. hearing all about this one. So mm -hmm. It's not called Swap Your Ride. It's like Swap Your Ride. Yeah, it's God, I can't, I'm blanking on it. I'm sorry. But the concept is, Happy. look, it's not about getting everybody into an electric car. That's You might as well ask them to buy a rocket, right? It's about if you can get somebody out of a of an old car that gets 18 miles a gallon into a car that gets 38 miles a gallon, that's a really significant improvement. By the way, you'll you'll reduce their fuel costs in a big way. Probably a more reliable car. So so it's sort of a broad range. 
But again, it's another piece of the theme where the where the climate action plan says you're doing some of the good stuff, amplify it 10 times over. Um, along those lines, weatherization, this is so straightforward, uh, good creating good jobs, saving people money when you weatherize their homes. This is the second biggest drain or source of emission for our state as we have old housing stock. And um, you immediately save people money, enhance their quality of life, actually have a health benefit has been attributed to a tighter oh, home. Yeah. And, um, and we're using less fuel to heat our homes. Um, so weatherization, we've done about 20,000 homes in the last 10 years. They're saying you got to do about 80,000 in the next eight years. So again, question of scale. Um, a lot of this comes back to another plank is, is workforce. You know, having money, which we do for weatherization at scale, and getting the job done are two very separate things. And, and I don't have a magic answer on this, but uh, nobody does. But we've got to keep our eye on, you know, our tech ed programs, Vermont Technical College, our community colleges, everybody in and our four-year state colleges and everybody in between. We've got to inspire the workforce um, to get into that. And 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 a part of it is the state saying, hey, not, hey, we have some money this year, we're going to put it into weatherization, but hey, for the next decade, this is a serious part of our strategy. And so businesses and organizations that do this work can plan and ramp up, um, you know, because it's not, it's not even just the personnel, it's the trucks, it's the, it's all the equipment that goes into it. Um, so I'm hopeful that workforce has got to be underpinning all of these conversations. And, and even then the state's its own workforce, um, state government. We don't. We're not. Th this work isn't done by state workers, but we don't have anyone in state government that has an eye necessarily uniquely on climate. This is such a big challenge. We can't give it to somebody and say, "Oh, and by the way, you're going to be in charge of our climate strategy." Right. So a lot of us are pushing for roughly about ten people that would be sort of an, uh, a department of environmental mitigation or, or whatever you want to call it, um, that, that has their eye, they're, they're administering the grants, they're making sure that uh, the grantees are accountable, that, that we have a comprehensive process, that they're reaching out to the Agency of Transportation and saying, are you guys doing complete streets? You know, we have money over here for that, um, so that we're, we're not kind of missing often right hand left hand not communicating in state government we need somebody that's coordinating and all for, of that for folks down in Wyndham County who are interested in this workforce issue Sion, which is a um coalition of um construction folks who are really interested in clean energy construction and um really like modern science weatherization have been working on a set of workforce training tools and classes for I think a decade at least and they're sort of they're based down here in Wyndham County um, in the Brattleboro area and have been a real big part of this conversation if folks want to get in touch with them and then the other big piece of this and the workforce piece for me is Vermont works for women and mm -hmm. making sure that these jobs and the job training are for um, for women for folks of color for disabled folks that there's a real opportunity to sort of step beyond who we usually think of as the construction worker on these conversations. Great. Thank you. I, I, I totally agree. And if we do it right, people hopefully will come to the state because they're interested in, in this work. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe they don't mean to move here forever, but they come here for five years, help us out, and then take what we're doing to their state, to their home state or whatever, and start up their business. I mean, there's a great opportunity here for entrepreneurs to help us through this. Um, and, and again, that, that's part of dependable ongoing funding. Um, you mentioned people interested locally. One of the, the programs that I think is the most straightforward and kind of exciting comes out of the Climate Action Plan is, is something we've done as a state. We call it the SEMP, State Energy Management Program, I think. I never, I'm, I'm terrible at acronyms this well, morning. But, uh, let's call it SEMP, right? Um, and so the basic idea is it's a revolving loan fund. We put some money in and then the state itself says, hey, this building, we're doing some work, let's weatherize this building and take it from the pot. And then they save money on their energy bill and use that savings and put it back in the pool. 
We need to we need to grow the pool for the state infrastructure. But more importantly, or more excitingly anyway, we need to do something similar so our towns and our schools, municipalities can can make those investments also. There should not be publicly owned buildings in Vermont that are that we're tolerant of being energy wasters. And we should lead that way. And it's a, it, and you know, all of these are smart investments. And so the public, we have now maybe some dollars to make those investments because they're upfront costs, but over time it's it's a clear winner. And I love the idea of activists, people who care about this and sort of scratch their head and they say in Brattleboro, well, I know Emily Kornheiser and Molly Burke are excellent on these issues. Like, what can I do? Well, you can go to your select board. You can go to your school boards and say, what's the climate plan here? What, what do we got? And, and you have some federal money and the state's trying to help incentivize this. So I, I think that's really exciting and, and uh, a way to localize some of this work. Fantastic. Um, Chris, we need to go to break and hear from some of our underwriters, but I just want to make sure any other um, top line concepts or, or things you want to leave listeners with before we go to break. Well, let's come back to them because there's a couple more after the break, maybe. Perfect. Perfect. And before we go to break, I just want to say two things. One, thank you for going through those, those top line issues, because while many folks who are really deeply involved in climate change has probably heard them, I think it's really important because what I heard was how much these, um, this climate plan is less of a, a bullet pointed list and more about a weaving together mm. of different actions to pull multiple levers at once around opportunity, around equity, around transition and resilience. So thank you for that. The second thing I'm gonna say is if you're a regular listener, you know that I have a very active building that I live with in, live in and um, they're doing brand, band practice. So if you hear music <laughs> leaking through the headphones that's what it is, even this early in the morning. So I apologize to listeners if you're going, what the heck is that background noise? That's what it is. We, um, Emily, anything quickly before we head to break? No. Break. We will be right back here on WBW 107.7 LP Brattleboro. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us wherever you find podcasts on our Facebook page, the Montpelier Happy Hour, as well as Emily's YouTube channel and Brattleboro Community Television and public access stations around the state. So thank you to everyone who's tuning in and all the platforms who carry us. We are quite grateful. Emily, what do we need to remind people of? The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, separately, of course, we don't share all the opinions, and not of any of the stations that might broadcast this, the platforms that are outside of any sort of federal policy control, or really anything else other than just the people talking and their own opinions. Thank you. Welcome. So if you're just uh, diving into the show, we are talking with Senator Chris Pearson from Chittenden County about the Global Solutions Act and the Climate Council and everything that they have been working on um, as we're getting ready for the legislative session. And Chris, I'd love to go back. You were diving into um, kind of the top goals of the Global Solutions Act. And you, I think you had like two or three to go. Uh, when yeah. we had to go for break. So please, I'd love to hear about those. Before Chris yeah. jumps in, I just want to clarify. So we had the Global Warming Solutions Act that had certain goals, and then we handed over, basically in doing that, we handed over a whole lot of strategic planning and decision-making to the Climate Council, who came out with their own really incredible, diligent, thorough plan on December 1st. Is that right? And then... Yep. We then as legislators um, and as a climate caucus of the legislature needed to take that huge report and set of recommendations and figure out which are actionable legislatively okay. this year. And so what we're talking about today is that sort of third step in the process. We had this Global Warming Solutions Act, we had the Climate Council on the recommendations, and now we need to figure out what legislation are we gonna move in order to fulfill the promise of all three of those. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For yeah. That. So sort of interpreting, 
interpreting the plan for the coming session for four and a half months, what can we try to get done? Uh, so we have an ambitious you. agenda, but it is certainly um, informed by the fact that we we only work for for a few months. Um, uh, one of the interesting things that it's exciting and important for a rural state like this is uh, around biodiversity and resilience. Of course, we know our forests are carbon sinks. We know our, our active agricultural lands can sequester carbon as well. Um, and, and so there is a call um, to make sure we protect forest blocks and biodiversity and, and we don't have deforestation. Um, federal scientists and others have called for uh, conserving between 30 and 50% of our waterways and our land. And so this session, the way I think of this is, is a beginning point. We just need an inventory. You know, how much of our land is already conserved? We don't really know. We've been doing that for a long time. We have state forests and, and, and other kinds of conserved land, but start us out on understanding where we sit. And then um, is there policy, you know, Emily and I both sit on the tax committee, the way we, we allow for current use, you know, should that be shifted? to allow for wilderness and not just managed forests, sustainably managed forests, et cetera. But, but trying to slow the deforestation and, and chopping up those large forest blocks because we understand more and more how vital they are to, to uh, effective carbon sinks and, and biodiversity. Um, so I think that's an interesting one that, that will be clearly, all of these are in some ways are multiple year, but that one uh, kicks off a process, I suspect. Um, that another one is what we call the clean heat standard. So I talked earlier about the renewable energy standard, which dictates what our utilities must buy in terms of increasing amounts of renewable energy. This is a similar concept for heat. Um, you know, and we would set out a path where Vermonters in, in our homes and in buildings would start to understand an expectation around transitioning away from oil heat or propane fossil fuel heat. Um, this is an interesting one because, and I think of it as, if, you know, if Emily or I proposed this in the recent years as just a legislator with an idea, I don't know that it would be received credibly. Um, but because the Climate Action Plan or Climate Council, which involved fuel dealers, which involved scientists and, and folks with a good analysis, they've come up with this. And in fact, you have green, you have uh, Vermont Gas up my way, you know, our natural gas utility at the table saying, yes, we do this. We have the fuel dealers at the table, maybe not jumping up and down about it, but recognizing, you know, if you're delivering oil to Vermonters and you think you're gonna have a business, the same business in 10, 12, 15 years, maybe it's time to think of an alternative strategy. So this is something that I don't think we'll do quickly, but we can set ourselves on a path to figuring out what would that look like? What are the incentives going to be to help Vermonters make a switch from their furnace, or certainly when we're replacing a furnace, make a different choice, whether it's heat pumps or geothermal or, or, or advanced wood, wood heat, et cetera. So um, clean heat standard, I think that's going to be a, one that will get some headlines will be the shiny object uh, of the session. And for, um, again, diligent listeners, this is another footnote, a verbal footnote, mm -hmm. Matt Coda from the Fuel Dealers Thank Association you. came on the show, again, some point in the last year to talk about um, what a transition would really mean for fuel dealers in Vermont and for all of us. And I, you know, full disclosure in all of these conversations, we still have an oil furnace in our house yeah. and we really like can't find our way to the thousands and thousands of dollars to replace it. And no, I know, yeah. right? No, it's not as healthy. Um, Vermont has some of the highest rates of asthma um, for a rural state anywhere. Usually it's thought of as a very, very urban sort of factory oriented problem, but Vermont has terrible asthma rates. And that is because of the particular way we heat our homes and the, you know, the very old wood stoves we use. Or um, So there's a lot of real options for not just saving the earth, but also, which we should do, but also improving our health and improving the strength of a really important sector of our economy. Yeah. And Olga, you mentioned earlier, you know, how, how do we make this accessible and exciting, not doom and, and oh, they're taken away. And, and I think this is a great point, right? If we say to Vermonters, you got five years to swap, swap out your oil furnace, people will rightly storm the castle, right? That, that is <laughs> totally unrealistic. 
when you look at, at, at the economy and, and what families are going through. But if we said, you know, hey, over the next 10 years, this is what we're going to do. And here are the incentives. And if you're a fuel dealer, here's how we're going to help you make it affordable for Vermonters. And, and, and you know, and so instead of, of mandating something, giving people the opportunity to do this, whether it's through subsidies, whether it's through, you know, a state workforce that helps you with geothermal in our, in our rural landscape, whatever it is, you know, making sure that it's a realistic option as opposed to a punitive kind of mindset. I think, I think it's vital. It's the only shot we've got really, um, realistically. Um, and so anyway, uh, the last one I would say that is, uh, I've saved the best for last in a way, Emily and I, and others in the climate caucus, climate solutions caucus, which is a group of 80 some legislators that have been fighting for this stuff for a long time. We have at times begged for 2 million, $3 million to amplify our weatherization work. We're spending roughly 12 to $15 million a year. And we've said, you know, let's make it 18 million. You know, we've really come hat in hand. And often we don't get it, I should say. You know, we've (laughs) in the last 10 years, we have not been running the bases here. Last year, because of the federal money, because of our our better understanding of climate, of the climate emergency, and because most importantly of the grassroots pressure that your listeners and others, the climate youth lobby, others have put on the legislature. We put a fence around $250 million to address climate. That, that, that's like, that's probably not enough, uh, even over time, but that is a big number. And so we now face this challenge of, well, how do we spend it? You know, there isn't quite the infrastructure we need to just grant out that money. And I think what a wonderful, wonderful challenge we have. And we have, you know, it's kind of easy to ramp up transportation, sustainable transportation ideas are in the hopper. We know about weatherization. If we can find the workforce, we can do that. But there's a big middle ground to figuring out how to spend that money. So if listeners have ideas, I think we're all ears. It's not got to be spent in one year. But to me, what's exciting is the sense of scale is appropriate. For the first time, it's actually comes close to honoring the challenge in front of us. And, you know, whether or not we can use all the federal money that way is, is still people are smarter people than me are figuring out. But but just as an example of the commitment that the legislature put forward, the governor signed into law in our budget is, is quite a signal and very, very different from where we've been in the past. And, and I, to that, I really do credit the grassroots for standing up and saying, make this a priority. Thank you, Chris. That was a great rundown. So Chris or Emily, what's next? Like what is the next four months going to look like? Uh, What can people expect? So I think the first thing that I really hope people expect in the next four months is an ability to have these conversations in their communities. So we had this 200 something conversation via Zoom last night. Um, with a lot of people from Wyndham County. We have our energy committee, we have 350, we have um, Mother Up, that's now called Parents for Something. And we have all of this really great energy in communities. And I think the one thing that I hope people can expect and I really want to do, but I need partners in doing, is to have these conversations about exactly these issues in our communities to make sure that as we're developing this policy, we're doing it informed by the folks who are gonna be impacted by it. The next thing, much more process um, and maybe less thrilling that is happening is legislation is being drafted. So a huge piece of the transportation conversation is going into a specific bill around transportation. And then some of it's gonna go into the regular, we call it the T bill. And it's like the main transportation bill that moves on transportation. So that's one piece of legislation. There are gonna be other pieces of legislation um, around the environmental justice issues that Chris talked about. And so those things right now are being sort of like, you know, legislative requests have been sent in, attorneys are drafting those pieces of legislation. As soon as the session starts, they'll be released. People will be signing on to those pieces of legislation. We'll find our way. Would like to, again, remind listeners, I think we did this last year, the process for signing onto legislation as a co-sponsor is a messy, 
not particularly strategic at all times, sort of haphazard if you happen to be sitting there, the person who's carrying around the piece of paper, you sign on to it if it's something you care about. So if like you care about an issue and you see that your legislator didn't sign on to it, like don't assume the worst. They might've just not been in the room that five minutes someone was carrying around a piece of paper. So people will be signing on to the legislation and then that legislation will be introduced in the committees. Committees will take it up or not, depending on the energy of the legislators in the room, the priorities of the speaker and the pro tem, and all of those things, whether or not it's prioritized, that comes from whether or not our listeners are making their voices heard, right? Like that's that energy. And so in the midst of all of the crises we are in simultaneously, like, again, it's about these local conversations about, it's about activating your legislators to make sure they know it's a priority. And then, you know, ideally it's all gonna get folded into the budget. We're all gonna vote on it. Everything's gonna pass. And then we'll figure out what we do next year and keep on moving through this climate action plan. My understanding also is that the Climate Council is having conversations about how they can continue their work. Yeah. They felt um, quite rightly that, that we were, we had put them between a rock and a hard place. This is an urgent crisis issue. It was very important to the legislation that we not allow the administration to kick the can on this. And so we put a very tight timeline because you know the polar bears are dying and we're having more extreme weather every day, but doing good work takes time. Building trust in um, marginalized communities takes time. These conversations take time. And so the Climate Council really feels that they have more to do still. And so I think we're, they're having conversations and we're having conversations about how we can sort of hold that group together, continue to rely on their expertise and collaborative work, while supporting all of the people on the Climate Council who have put in really like full-time work over the last year on this, and some of them are barely being compensated for it. So that's another sort of piece of the puzzle. I'd just like to add, I totally agree with what you said, Emily. And one of the most persistent questions I get from activists and people who say, well, I want to help. What do I do? What is the best way to reach legislators? That's what they say. I, I get this question a lot. And my answer is yes. <laughs> the best way to reach a legislator is sort of like, how do I reach my neighbor? If you have their email address, you should email them. If you bump into them at the street, uh, on the street, you should just politely say, hey, what are you doing for climate? You know, call them up. There's no right or wrong way. People, people are, are worried that they're doing it wrong. Just send them an email. Hey, climate's really important to me. Can you tell me what you're doing? That would work. You know, if somebody sends you a link, if Sierra Club or somebody sends you a link and says, click here, that works too. It's yeah. not as it's not as good as you writing an actual email to one of your legislators. All of us, our emails are, are available on the legislative website. You can even look up who your legislator is if you don't know. But the point is sort of don't worry that you're doing it better or worse or whatever. Just try something. Just try something, see what you happen. Hopefully, you'll you'll start to engage in a in a back and forth, and and you know, in a few months, you'll be able to say, "Hey, thanks for voting for S two twenty or whatever it is," and and you'll you'll find yourself easily into the system in that sense. But but I really just want to say, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Just just say hi. Yeah, we are deeply real people with messy morning hair who you know walk our kids to school. And not you, Chris, your hair looks great. Um, who, you know, walk our kids to school and are at the grocery store on Sundays. If you're gonna like jump into a conversation say like, hey, how are you first? Like you would with any other human. Um, but yeah, I I personally, I prefer like a barely cogent two line email to a clicked, um, to a clicked automatic survey. I, you know, voicemails work. Like Chris said, stopping me in the grocery store works. Really, whatever it is, it's all fine. If you see me walking down the street, feel free to like pull over on the dirt road and start a conversation. Um, and you don't have to just say, I care about climate. You can say like, hey, I heard you talking about climate. I'm really excited, but this is the most important piece of this to me. Or I'm so scared you're gonna get this one piece wrong. Whatever it is, just like jump in and start the conversation. Thank you. That is wonderful, Chris and Emily. So um, one thing I'm fascinated about, and I think about this a lot because we live in on the state border, basically, Emily and I do. Um, 
And I'm always curious about how regulations fit together, especially during transitions. So for example, um, as folks know, I'm a freelance journalist. I also have a day job uh, at an architectural firm. And I was listening to a conversation with coworkers the other day, and they were talking about um, trying to meet weatherization goals and, and honor uh, the historic fabric of a building at the same time and meet some federal reg regulations and how, you know, it was just something they were wrestling with, not good or bad, just something they were wrestling with. But it got me thinking about, you know, what happens when we put in XYZ regulations, but meanwhile at the federal level or in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, our neighbors have a different regulation. You know, how are we going to get that to work together? Um, yeah. So I think good regulation lifts all boats, right? Um, so one example of that unrelated to climate is Vermont's minimum wage being higher actually raises wages on the border in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. right? We see yes. that every day in our sort of day-to-day -day lives. And Massachusetts higher wages sometimes have the opportunity to raise the wages in Brattleboro, right? So there's that piece of it. The other piece of it that's really important that I think Chris was talking about earlier was the fact that we have not adequately staffed these conversations at the state mm -hmm. level. And so when I say good regulation, I don't just mean good regulation on paper. I mean, good regulation that is actualized with quality staffing to be supportive in a regulatory framework. And so a lot of the challenges that I think Vermonters have had over the last decade plus around how to navigate um, building and planning regulations is actually from a lack of capacity at the state level to have those conversations in a strategic, positive, supportive regulatory framework. We see that there are other state agencies that are funded differently that are capable of engaging in positive regulatory control, um, that are capable of really educating and partnering with folks to make sure that everyone understands the full regulatory landscape and that is possible for environmental and planning regulations as well. And I'm really hopeful that as we move forward, we can adequately fund and staff those positions so that when folks in Brattleboro are doing building, doing buildings, doing planning, doing weatherization, they'll be able to not just learn easily how to meet Vermont regulations and federal regulations, they'll have someone who's at the table with them that can actually also help them learn the why and the building science and the um, that will also small carpenters in areas that are not part of large contracting firms will know what rules they're subject to and will have the supports they need to actually use those that building science so that they can do a better job for their customers. Because at this point, I think that most employers in Vermont and many businesses in Vermont just don't even know the rules they're subject to because we have never adequately staffed the communication around all of this. Yeah. Well, and to add another layer to that, just an explicit layer is that if a bureaucracy is un unintelligible or if people can't access it, eventually they will start avoiding it. And then that defeats the purpose of the regulations to begin with. Exactly. Yeah. We're yes. always going to we're always going to run into these challenges. You know, the structure of our government and the the autonomy of the states is, you know, potentially frustrating. Uh, and I'm not sure we can undo that. Although there are some regional approaches that have been successful around electric generation, um, and then there are examples where you're seeing, for instance, a few years ago we passed the bill around the coolant that this that is in um, stores that that go through those big cooling systems those are terrible they had been uh, uh, hfcs have as so-called hydrofluorocarbons are a really bad greenhouse gas um, and we in vermont banned those for new construction a few years ago and just i think six months ago the Biden administration banned them for the country. So in that sense, our businesses were a few months or a few years ahead of the game, right? And so this is what I mean, where there's, that's an opportunity, you know, the, at the time, 
I wasn't terribly controversial, by the way, because it's the science is so straightforward. But but at the time, you can understand businesses say, well, you know, don't don't disadvantage me against New Hampshire. Those convenience stores don't have to do this. But actually, now it's starting to flip. Hey, you're ahead of the game. You know, now New Hampshire doesn't have a choice and and Vermont's already taken care of this investment. So I think it goes both ways. There's always going to be some tension, but to the extent that that we can be in concert, that's stronger, particularly, as Emily said, for the practitioners that are actually going into build, buildings to do this work. It's really important that at least we're clear of the, the requirements. Thank you. Um, this has been a great conversation. And of course, all great conversations, they seem to just fly by like that. So we have about five minutes left. And so I want to circle back to you, Chris, and just make sure, is there anything else you wanted to make sure we touch on um, or leave listeners with uh, about this very big topic in a very tiny moment? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we have a very big challenge in a very short session. And, and you know, the legislature is... I can't remember. I've been there better part of 15 years. I can't remember going into a session with more challenges and needs on our table in front of us than this one. And that's even absent the climate, uh, which is a big priority for me. So I, I, I guess I would just say this is where the grassroots really matters. And, and particularly around climate, because we all understand there's not a lot of climate deniers really in Montpelier. There's some people who would prioritize it differently, I guess. And, and maybe Emily sees it more in the House than I do in the Senate. But, yeah. but you know, the mental health crisis, the housing crisis, these are more tangible in a sense than maybe we'll have more flooding this summer, right? You know, I mean, those are pretty tangible. They're getting more and more tangible in the climate. But but the the some of the other financial crises that the state faces are are kind of right in front of us. And and so where grassroots really can help is to just have an ongoing, consistent little bit of pressure. Hey, this is really important. You can't let this one slide. Um, and and that will I think help us. You know, what we've laid out today is, is things that a large group of us, including leadership, are, are willing to attempt, but it's by no means a, a slam dunk. I mean, that is getting, getting even two, three of what we've talked about today across the finish line would be a significant accomplishment. So trying to get 10 or more is not easy. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's not because, sorry, Chris, it's not because of lack of will or lack of desire or lack of understanding of the urgency. We have a citizen legislature that meets for four and a half months of the year, four days a week. And we are all working like a million hours during the off session, but the actual legislative work really only happens between that, during that very short time. And people want us to do good work, not just fast work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with, what's the old adage? Good, fast, cheap, pick two. Um, and, and I would remind listeners, because I think this is something we forget about our democracy, is democracy is meant to go slowly. And yes, I think there are many ways we could make it more nimble uh, and be able to respond faster to people's needs. But to do good work takes time. And um, so I appreciate the time that everyone who is working on uh, the Climate Council and towards these issues is, is taking. I really appreciate it. Um, we are about to sign off here, so I just want to make a quick toast to uh, moving forward on mitigating to climate change and uh, making our state more resilient. So cheers to everyone. <laughs> Thanks, mm -hmm. Olga. Senator Chris Pearson, Representative Emily Kornheiser, thank you for joining us today. Um, Chris, if people want to find more information on what the Climate uh, Committee is doing, where can they find that? Uh, we have a website, actually, vtclimatecaucus.org. You can find our YouTube page uh, and similarly, Facebook and Twitter um, are, are all found by VT Climate Caucus. And um, we do try, Sarah Copeland hands us and I are the co-chairs of the Climate Solutions Caucus. We try to do roughly a weekly video update um, so people can follow that. Nice. Uh, and then there are all manner of grassroots climate groups that will help 
translate the progress and when these become bills so you know the number so there's a lot of ways for people to plug in um, but you can also reach us individually if you want to know those links or or any details great emily how about you Folks can go to emilycornheiser.org and you'll find links to my email, to my social media accounts, to any updates about upcoming conversations or news articles, all there at emilycornheiser.org. I also wanna take a minute to just talk about, say goodbye to a local climate hero. Abby Manukin has been working at 350 Vermont for a very long time and has been yeah. an incredible asset to the Wyndham County area and the statewide conversation on climate. And she is leaving 350 Vermont at the end of this year. She is staying in Wyndham County. She's oh, staying in Brattleboro. <laughs> She's gonna keep on fighting the good fight wherever she is every minute of the day, but she won't be with 350 anymore. And so I just wanna thank her for her incredible service to that organization. Yes, thank you, Abby. Thank you for all your work. Um, thank you for joining us. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. We will be back next Friday with a fresh episode. Until then, everyone, have a great week. Cheers.